is him uh, with whom I have uh, uh, been in association, I think, from 2011 onwards. Uh, so I'm a bit worried, I'm a bit nervous, but yeah, I would definitely like to introduce uh, my uh, one time he was my supervisor to some work and yeah. So, born in 1939 in Mangalore, in the present day Karnataka, Dr. Walter is in Mangalore, went on to obtain his PhD degree from Institute Catholic de Paris in La Sorbonne. Uh, I hope I can pronounce it. Uh, currently, he is the director of Northeastern Social Research Center, Guwahati, which he founded in the year 2000. Prior to this, Dr. Fernandez was the director of the Delhi-based Indian Social Institute and also the director of research at Animation and Resource Center in Yangon, Myanmar from 2013 to 2015. Dr. Fernandez has done extensive work on diverse issues such as tribal rights, livelihood issues, land rights, climate justice, peace initiatives, and development-induced develop, uh, displacement across India and more specifically in the Northeast. His writings on these pertinent issues have appeared in the forms of books, articles in journals, and in popular media as well. He was also the editor of the journal Social Action. Some of his important works, uh, it is just to mention only a few, are Search for Peace with Justice, Issues Around Conflicts in Northeast India, Relations Across Borders, Communities Separated by the Indo-Myanmar Border, Progress at Whose Cost, Development Induced Displacement in West Bengal, 1947 to 2000, Rethinking Autonomy, Self-Determination and Sovereignty, Search for Peace in Northeast India, Uprooted for Whose Benefit, Development Induced Displacement in Assam from 1947 to 2000, The Tista on the Run, Development Induced Displacement in Sikkim, 1975 to 2010, Ownership, Management and Alienation, Tribal Land in Northeast India, Landscape of Conflicts and Peace in the Northeast, The Role of Religion. These are just a few of his uh, books as well as uh, either uh, sole uh, authored or with uh, his colleagues and uh, researchers. Dr. Fernandez's lifelong dedication and tireless works among the marginalized and disadvantaged is an inspiration for researchers, activists, and policymakers. He is a rare personality who believes and very sincerely combines research with action. A strong voice of indigenous population and the marginalized, Dr. Fernandez never shied away from taking a position and speaking truth to the power for creating a better, democratic, and just world, dreaming and believing in the spirit of leaving no one behind. With these few words, I invite you, sir, to deliver your lecture today. Uh, and before sir starts his uh, presentation, I would request every other uh, participant to mute your mics as well as the video so that the speaker uh, gets more clarity and uh, no disturbance is uh, there for him while he presents his, uh, or while he gives his presentation. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you to your department, your colleagues, and others. Now, I'll uh, focus on the Northeast, but I'll divide my lecture into three parts. The first is uh, the definition of indigenous peoples, the second is in the indigenous people in India. And the, the biggest part, the third one, will be on the indigenous peoples of the Northeast and where do we stand. And I'll end with some reflection on where do we go from here. The first part that has to be recognized is that there is lack of consensus on the definition of indigenous peoples. The, uh, it's easy in the Americas where the first struggle of the indigenous peoples began from 1927 already when seven nations of <coughs> North America, of uh, US and Canada demanded a common passport, common uh, recognition of the uh, of the 
nationality from the League of Nations. They sent a delegation and to the International Labour Organization. That is where the real first struggle began. But there is lack of consensus because uh, both on the definition of indigenous peoples and on the number of indigenous peoples. Now, it has been de defined by the indigenous peoples of America. <laughs> their advantage is that they could fix a definite day of their conquest by the, with the landing of Christopher Columbus in San Domingo in uh, October 1492. But it's more difficult, I'll come to that, more difficult in India. The second is a question of numbers. In the, when they first began, the UN was speaking of 300 millions. But as Dr. Gorima said, today they are speaking of about 450 million in 92 countries. But it remains vague. Where, where exactly, how many, where, who are the, in the exact indigenous peoples is difficult to decide. Thirdly, there is the whole issue of sovereignty and self-definition that uh, that I lost, uh, th that is mentioned in the Convention 169 of ILO of 1989. It is not defined, and that's another area of, of uh, uh, division. Now, uh, the definition of North America is based on chronology. That is difficult in a country like India and much of Asia, except Australia and New Zealand, where they have sort of sidelined, conquered, eliminated the indigenous peoples, and uh, the whites are dominating. But it's not uh, as uh, easy in India and the rest of uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, and the rest of Asia, and Africa. Chronology is difficult because many communities have lived side by side in this country and in the much of the Asian continent for centuries. But in this living side by side, where there is domination dependency syndrome. There are dominant groups in, uh, in India, it would be mostly the uh, Aryan Dravidian communities against the remaining groups. Secondly, the government of India does and uh, um, the indigenous state. rejects the very con concept of sovereignty, though the definition is not clear. Thirdly, the fundamentalist groups in India say that all Indians are indigenous to the country, so uh, none can claim the indigenous status. It's true particularly about those who reject the uh, concept of uh, Aryan migration. That's a, uh, of, the, uh, of the whole of India. The Northeast has its specific situation and that needs to be studied. It concerns the identity, economy and culture. The Northeast has about 200 indigenous la languages, most of which are endangered. Now that is very important because while the the indigenous communities in, as a whole uh, have an, a mar marginal status, a, an endangered language makes them more marginal because a language is not just a mode of speaking. It is linked to their traditional knowledge and identity. So. Uh, loss of a language marginalizes them further. 
So in this context, I believe that a new definition is needed of the indigenous status. In order to move towards this, let us look at the situation in India as a whole and the Northeast in particular. Now, let's begin, go back to the indigenous year. While 9th August is declared the World Indigenous Day because the meeting of India was, was held on this day in 1982, the UN declared 1992 the indigenous year from October 1992 till the end of 93, till the beginning of 94 because it marked the fifth centenary of the arrival of Christopher Columbus, which meant that it also marked five centuries of the conquest of the um, American indigenous peoples, the Amerindians. They, they, used, they used to be called Red Indians, but today they prefer to call themselves Amerindians. Secondly, the UN declared two indigenous decades, 1994 to 2003 and 2004 to 2013. We did a study of the indigenous decades in the Northeast. In the third year of the second decade, back in 2006, except for a few leaders, and some communities of Nagaland, no tribe in the Northeast was aware of such a thing, that there was something called an indigenous decade. And it shows a certain situation that uh, the indigenous issue is important for the people of the Northeast, but they are not aware of their identity, the whole, all the whole issue, except a few leaders who go to Geneva and New York for the meetings, the ordinary people are not aware of it. And that, I think, is a serious matter. Now, uh, it is important because Indian tribals, tribal communities try to mark the indigenous here and decade but they need you cannot go by the chronological status and then there is difference between mainland india and the northeast while in mainland india it's all the tribes that call themselves indigenous and a few uh Dali groups like, like uh, uh, had a East India Company. So the year in which they became uh, a colony and became part of political part of uh, India because till then the North is, was linked to Burma, not to mainland India. Culturally, yes, they were cultural religious links but politically it was it was it was linked to burma 26 february 1826 marked that the political link with the rest of india now while it is important for the northeast as a whole having this year uh, as uh, the beginning of uh, as the year of the indigenous status creates conflicts, two types of conflicts, one between the tribes and non-tribal communities that are powerful, the, the one between the tribes, the, the, uh, the uh, Kuki and Naga 
on one side and the Meite in Manipur, the tribes and non-tribals in Assam. There is the power, power, power non-power, uh, domination dependency syndrome there. On one side, it creates a conflict between the powerful and less powerful indigenous groups. And it, on the other side, it excludes big groups like the Adivasi, who are central, the tea, tea uh, garden workers, who are 20% of Assam population, and they are the ones who have built up the uh, tea industry, which is central to the economy of uh, Assam, and they are excluded. So it creates two different conflicts. And I think it's important to bear that in mind when it comes to the Northeast. Uh, this, what is particularly the Seven Sisters, in Sikkim the conflict is slightly different between the locals like the Lepcha and what, those whom they call immigrants. But I'll focus mostly on the Seven Sisters which I know better. Uh, now, to go back to the All India situation, out of India's population of 1.25 billion, today it's 1.3 billion, 8.6%, which is in 2011, there were 100 million, there are more today, are tribal indigenous. Spread the, uh, over nine states of the fifth schedule, but spread also over other states like West Bengal and southern states which do not have uh, the fifth schedule. In mainland India, uh, they are 20 to 30 percent in Odisha, Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand. Their number is lower in the rest and they are below 3 percent in the three southern states, Kerala, Karnataka and, uh, and uh, Tamil Nadu. In the Northeast, out of the seven sisters, uh, out of the eight states of the Northeast, they are the majority in four small states, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Mizoram, and Meghalaya. They are, but they are only 12.9% in Assam, which is home to thirds, two thirds of the Northeast population. They are 31% in Tripura, 40% in Manipur, and I think 22% in Sikkim. Now, that creates uh, domination dependency issues, and it has been central to many ethnic conflicts. And the whole land issue of uh, uh, land issue and migration issue, which Now, to come to the, the tribes of India belong to three the small tribe, the ethnic affinity to the people of Africa. You anthropologists call them Negroid. They are mainly the small tribes under under Nicobar and the South. Then you have those with ethnic affinity with the indigenous peoples of Oceania and Southeast Asia. The, the anthropologists call them Australoid and they are the biggest number. And the, then you have the affinity with people of Southeast Asia whom anthropologists call Mongoloids. Most tribes of North, Northeast India belong to that. So do the tribes of Himachal and Uttarakhand. So uh, the tribes of India, I, sorry, there's a, a typing error there, are ethnically different from each other. But they are also different from the two dominant groups of Aryans and Dravidians. So there you have a second domination dependency syndrome. In Northeast India, there is great diversity 
with bad Tibetan Sino uh, Chinese or Sino Tibetan and but they are not Sans they are not of Sanskrit or Dravidian origin. Their languages are not of Sanskrit and Dravidian origin, but they are Sino Tibetan. Now the tribes insist on this specificity of indigenous peoples. When they speak of indigenous peoples, they want this to be stressed, that they, they belong to different ethnic communities. And that creates a uh, divide between them and the dominant groups. And secondly, um, as I said, a majority of the switch of the uh, majority of the uh, this one to be uh, language are endangered and language is also traditional knowledge and identity and they, that can lead to their further marginalization and that is something that one needs to bear in mind now what is happening to them uh, the constitution has privileges under the fifth and sixth schedule. In the northeast, it's under the sixth schedule for reservation in jobs, education, legislature. Now, uh, there are laws preventing tribal land alienation, but uh, but. Uh, uh, much of India, mainland India. There is great poverty and marginalization of the tribal communities. The Adivasi, who were who were forced to uh, of Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, who were forced to come to West Bengal, North Bengal, and Assam as tea garden workers, symbolize that impoverishment. Now, their poverty keeps the majority of them away from accessing these privileges because they are made legally available but not accessible education is free but most of most parents are not in a position to send their children to school so the privileges do not make much sense to them so only a small minority among them uh, against access to them, which means that more social steps are required to make these privileges accessible to them. Their illiteracy, malnutrition have to be uh, recognized. What does the indigenous status mean to them when they are illiterate and malnourished? The status itself cannot solve their problem. More long solution. Secondly, what does it the indigenous the God recognize the indigenous reason? The first reason for it is the divide and rule policy. The British div uh, divided the different peoples. Uh, so, in reaction, the freedom fi fighters did not want any recognition of different peoples in India. There was a move towards centralization. And that is central to the conflicts, the nationalist struggles in the Northeast. Because the... Uh, the Naga struggle, for example, began when an effort was made to impose a single administration and political system on them. They were, they were, uh, they had kept their identity. They, uh, the British had uh, kept them, uh, allowed them to run their affairs according to their. Uh, the uh, customary law, but 
suddenly a single administration single identity was imposed on them that led to that was basic to the uh, to the identity then there is the difficulty of defining the exact date i have already mentioned that and then the fundamentalist stand that all peoples are indigenous to the to, to the countries so they refused to accept the indigenous status the ilo convention 169 not 69 as i have put there it speaks of right to sovereignty and self determination but doesn't define it so ethnic conflicts and nationalist struggles result from such problems now the indigenous the tribal communities want the indigenous status not for what the main mainstream understands as sovereignty that is independence but it's part of their identity and the con- uh, autonomy to manage their autonomy that is what uh, many of them call sovereignty there are a few who speak of independence but that's a small number in other words sovereignty has economic and identity implications the tribal regions are bound in mineral and natural resources at the all india level 80% of coal 45% of iron ore 60% of forest and major water resources are found in the tribal areas and these are the resources that the governments want for the development of the country and the tribals want a share in running these resources managing these resources and what do not want them to be alienated from them completely and they themselves to be displaced and mar- marginalized the northeast for example has 60% about 60 uh, million uh, 60000 megawatt of hydro power potential now some tribes view sovereignty and self determination also uh, as control over their administration economy and protection of land and forests not as independence so this issue needs to be recognized the opposite is view is that the state should control them that is the uh, for national development that is the view of most governments so there is uh, a conflict around the issue of sovereignty which is not independence but control over the risk this indigenous it is and sovereignty that is control over the economy and political systems go hand in hand and it is not independence so that part need to be recognized that there is a difference of understanding of sovereignty and economy and also the main causes of their poverty has to be understood the fact that their regions are resource rich they are displaced or deprived of the livelihood in order to exploit their water mineral and other resources and to protect forests in india the formal law recognizes individual ownership alone and most tribes live on community land which is the which the formal law con- law considered state property so its inhabitants are treated as encroached 
who can be evicted easily and not counted when, for example, they are displaced in order to exploit the resources. Its result is that in India as a whole, the tribes who are 8.8% of India's population are 40% of its uh, displaced and project affected persons who are deprived of their livelihood. They pay the price of develop for the development of others without getting benefits themselves. 40% is 30 million out of 110 million. More than 25% of them have been deprived of their livelihood in the name of national development. In the Northeast, out of about 3.5 million, about more than 50% are tribals. So they pay a high price. So, Take, for example, estimates which uh, we have done ourselves indicate that about seven, there are about 70 million BP displaced persons or project affected persons from 30 million hectares, 1947 to 2010. Around 30% of land is common property resources. As a result, 40% of the displaced and PAPs are tribals. And another 40% are other landless uh, among the displaced. For example, in Assam, by official count, 391,772.9 acres were used for all projects 1947 to 2000 and they displaced 300 3,10,142 but the study we conducted showed that there were 14 lakhs 5,008 you see the number uh, acres and 19.16 lakh displaced PAPs, not less than this, and, uh, sorry, I have repeated there. And secondly, the, uh, and most, those, those who are not counted are the common property resources and tribals. So, about, uh, more than 50% of those of the displaced persons are tribals and they have not been counted because they depend on uh, CPRs. Take, for example, another case, Tripura. By official count, 2,361 families were displaced, about 13,000. The reality is 8,500 to 9,000 families, 45 to 50,000 almost all of them tribals they have not been counted so that is one and the neoliberalism the new economic policy of 1991 makes their situation worse the draft rehabilitation policy of the government of india 1994 begins by saying that a dis uh, rehabilitation policy is required because more land than in the past has to be acquired uh, uh, because uh, with the new economic policy to encourage Indian and forest private, uh, foreign private investment and much of it will be for mining in the tribal areas. So new laws were enacted to come to the Northeast, for example, has a list of 169 massive hydroelectrical projects planned, mostly in Arunachal Pradesh and Sikkim, where the population is small, but biodiversity is high. And one more feature of the tribal areas is that they are biodiversity rich. So the new economic policies a bigger attack 
on their livelihood and biodiversity. And it may, can mean greater marginalization. And that has to be recognized again. So, the, then you have the whole process in the Northeast of uh, the transition from the formal from the customary law through which they manage their, their land to uh, the formal law. And that makes encroachment easy. In uh, Assam, for example, at Independence, there were 25 what are called uh, belts and uh, swan, protected areas of the tribals. The number has come down to 14 today and the area is smaller. So the system has, then the law has been changed to make encroachment on their land easier. So encroachment becomes easier and that is basic to alienation, both to uh, legal, uh, to uh, local dominant groups and immigrants. Secondly, uh, the, uh, the women's status is better among the tribes, but of course the women are not equal among the tri tribes, but their status is better. Modernization, imposition of the formal system on them without preparation strengthens patriarchy and class formation. So, for example, that, uh, I can give many examples, but uh, no, there's not much time, so I'll make it short. So, for example, rubber corporation introducing rubber demanding individual ownership in the name of the family head, say among the Garo. A condition for loans and subsidies is that it should be of an individual family head, understood as man, in a matrilineal society. So, without preparation, it strengthens patriarchy and strengthens the class formation. Third, our study showed that 30% of the uh, Garo in that district became landless within two decades. Now, secondly, the type of development, the infrastructure, education, health institutions, centralized in Guwahati and Shillong, good quality education. So to send their children to uh, the uh, big to the these colleges, good colleges, parents have to sell their land to richer elements within the community. So class formation in the egalitarian internal land alienation. Also because <coughs> rural transport is neglected. Transport is high highways from the northeast to the ASEAN countries and within city, between cities, rural transport. So even when there are good private schools and colleges in the uh, rural areas of the northeast, parents are not able to send their children. They have to be sent to a hostel. That is money. So the options are more limited in case of a health emergency they have to sell their best land, uh, best land to at a throwaway price in order to take a position to the central areas. So landlessness and ethnic conflicts are result from it. So, so these raise many justice issues on the identity of the tribes' indigenous people. Their right to manage their affairs as part of a larger state is not recognized. Right over their resources as part of national development to a life with dignity. They are considered national resource, but they do not part 
form part of that nation. So they demand a right to be part of national development instead of paying the price for the development of another class, which means right to growth as respect respectable humans, which means we can make some suggestions at the end. First of all, they need to, their customary, their tradition needs to be respected. But of course, it has to be modified and modernized with regard to gender and class, class, uh, class equality. Get the formal law to recognize community ownership in order not to alienate it.